defensiveness is really about protecting ourselves and our sense of worth. Because when information is coming towards us, that feels like it's crackling our base in some way. We've got to find some way to repair that so that we don't crumble. That defensiveness just seeps in in the relationship, which really says, I need to protect myself before I can even enter into what it is that you're saying. Well, hello there, and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show. I have a really special guest on. We just had a great conversation. Her name is Dr. Tracy Douglish. She is a couples therapist, and I met her on Instagram. I think her content just came across in my feed, and I was like, wow, I really like how this lady thinks about relational stuff. She really is an original thinker. Uh, for almost two decades, she's provided direct clinical services as well as researching, writing, speaking about relationships. So she works with, you know, she's a psychotherapist with couples. She also does individuals and corporate wellness stuff. What I love about this book that she has just written, which is called, I didn't sign up for this, A Couples Therapist Shares Real Life Stories of Breaking Patterns and Finding Joy in Relationships, including her own, is she gives us all of these case studies and real life examples of ways that relationships break down and ways that you can change that. So I hope that you enjoy this very exciting interview that I just did with Dr. Tracy as much as I enjoyed interviewing her. I'm so excited to have my pal, Dr. Tracy, on The Terry Cole Show. Hi, welcome friend. Hi, Terry. I'm so thrilled to sit with you and having left so inspired after our last conversation together. And then also having you in my ears recently talking about HFCs, high functioning codependence. And yes. oh, you should have seen me nodding, nodding along the whole way. So I'm thrilled all, to be here. All of you. my friends are HFCs, Dr. Tracy. I'm just saying, high functioning codependence. It's not just you. We are the doers, the givers, the assuagers, the get it doneers. But damn, we're tired. So we get tired. Moving into, we tired. <laughs> Let's talk about relationships. So your book came out in September. I didn't sign up for this. A couple of therapists shares real life stories, of breaking patterns and finding joy in relationships, including her own and your super popular social media stuff. I think that's how you and I came to be I'm trying to remember, but I think so. Yes. Is that I saw some posts and I was like, Oh, look, someone who has an original brain. Yay. I love that. So, That's such a compliment. Thank you. <laughs> it's very true, though. And and I think that what I really love about your work is the accessibility that the way, you know, your unique way of communicating these concepts, because as we both know as clinicians, you know, the concepts can be mm. like heady and theoretical and like, okay, I get it intellectually, but what the hell does that mean in my real life? Mm. So what I love about your book and what I love about what you put out on social is that you're giving us examples. You're giving us real life, relational examples of what it looks like. So let's talk a little bit about what you see as the most problematic patterns that people come to you with as a couples therapist that you've been for a long time. Like what are the biggest or the most problematic patterns that you see? Oh, I could go into this in so many ways. And <laughs> I, I do really appreciate that experience of how hard it is to translate the knowledge and the moment to moment experience we have with clients. It's such a, it's such a, a skill in some way, but also such a gift to be able to do it. And mm -hmm. that, that was this book. So the first pattern for us to maybe even talk about is the overlap with your work, which is around the codependency. Mm -hmm. And first for listeners to know, we do tend to overuse these words. So I'm always cautious to not label ourselves or to criticize ourselves for how we show up and instead bring more curiosity and compassion to our experience because there are really good reasons for the things that we do. Mm -hmm. And so at the foundation of building a healthy relationship is we're trying to aim for interdependence. Mm -hmm. And that is that sense of two separate people who are differentiated. There's a sense of autonomy where I can say, here, here am I and I am okay. 
And then here's you and you are also okay. And that's just the simple sentence that I say, I am me, you are you, and we are both okay. And yet the most common pattern we get stuck in is that sense of codependency or over swinging into hyper independence, which is the, (laughs) I'm going to push you out. I'm not going to share with you. I'm going to keep this all to myself. Mm. And building interdependence is actually something that not many of us have experienced in our earliest yeah. relationships. It's so true with the interdependence, but, but why, do you, why do you think that is if we're looking at childhood reasons? What, what are your clinical thoughts about why? Mm, I just had this conversation with someone this morning too, <laughs> in the sense of not being able to understand that as a child, I'm not responsible for mom and dad's feelings. Mm. they're upset, they're separate from me, but I don't have to be the good kid to have them happy. And of course, as children, what do we do? We want to see our parents happy. And so then when we don't have the teachings from our parents of you're not responsible. Yes, I am having big feelings and I myself as your mom right now, I'm frustrated. I'm overstimulated. That's not yours. That's mine. And I'm going to go take five minutes and I'll be right back to come back and connect with you. When Mm -hmm. we can do that separation of saying, I am me, you are you, what's responsible for what, then we learn I can be a separate person from my partner down the road. Or then we also think of growing up in a household of emotional neglect, where parents are not emotionally warm, where perhaps there's even high standards or focused on achievements. Then in that sense, we also learn to watch our caregivers and to monitor things and to develop these coping strategies in a way to build connection. And that's really what I come back to when we look at these patterns and two of the most common ones, uh, the first one would be the over-functioning and under-functioning. And the other one is more of that blame, pursue, withdraw, or the pursuing and defending. I'm always careful with that name because that pursuer tends to get the the kind of like, oh, I'm the squeaky wheel. I'm the I'm the quote unquote bad partner that does that. But to look at these behaviors that we do in a relationship as adaptive strategies from our earliest relationships Mm. and recognizing today that they might not be adaptive. Right. Well, so much of it is it was adaptive and like amazing that little us can figure it out with nobody gave us any instructions. We just Mm. were like, oh, this is how I could stay safe. Yay. But of course, so much of that becomes maladaptive. But would you say more about the pursuer defender thing? Mm, Yes, that is one partner is looking for connection. And this partner says, they they put a bid out there. If we use the Gottman's language, the bids for connection. Yeah. Um, we, We do the knock, knock. Are you there? I'm, you know, trying to get your attention in some way. And then maybe I put it out in, maybe I put out in a complaint, which is okay, but, or sometimes it comes out in the criticism and that criticism, then it's this infinity loop that I like to look at. So there's no one bad person. It is a dynamic that can, that re self reinforces and breeds more negative emotions and unmet needs. But the more we knock at our partner's door, if they don't open it to respond to us, we feel that sense of anxiety inside of us. And so we're pursuing and moving closer and towards them. And our partners, if they're not able to have that solid sense of self to open the door and say, I hear you, I see you. Yes, this is something that's happening for you. I'm here. They keep the door closed and they either they're defensive or they shut down. And the more one partner defends and stays shut down, the more the other partner pursues. And ultimately what they're both trying to do is to find that sense of safety and connection. So how is so funny because in one of my courses today, I literally just had someone asking me a question about they are anxiously avoidantly attached. Their partner is insecurely attached. The partner is insisting and it were asking like that, the 20 times a day that he says, I love you, that she say it back, then that anytime she's not enthusiastic about it, he feels rejected. And Mm -hmm. she's like, here's the thing. It feels like a test all the time. It feels contrived. Like none of this is taking into consideration my thing. And 
She's like, I do it to keep the peace, but if I feel like a robot, you know? So what would you say to those couples, that couple? Mm, yes. The individual who is the knocking at the door while Yes, we do need our partners to show up and be responsive to us. It's not possible for them to meet every inkling inside of us of self-doubt, of questioning our lovability. And the analogy I like to use is it's the bucket with a hole in it. And my partner fills up the bucket, but if there's if it's broken at the bottom, it's just pouring out and yep. we have to fix the hole. Yep. And so part of that work, of course, you know, it's so interesting. We think we're going to couples therapy because we need to fix our relationship. And I know you know this. I know you talk about this and all of the work that you do is we're, we're actually fixing ourselves first. We have to go inside of ourselves and say, okay, how do I contribute to this dynamic? And if I have this bucket with a hole in it, I need to start patching it up in some way because it is not possible for my partner to respond to every single one of our needs. And, and that is a bit of this swinging or flip-flopping that we've done in relationships where we say, okay, you are my only person now and you must give me everything I need. And the reality yeah. is no one person can possibly do that for us. Yep. Yeah. You mentioned uh, Gottman and... Um... They have, a, they have a new book out about fighting right, which is interesting. So I think I'm going to have them on the show at some point because I just got the book. But their work has been very influential in my own work and, of course, very pivotal for any of us who focus on relationships and love and all that stuff, that the bidding for attention and that how often your partner. So bidding for attention, for those of you who don't know, it's just it's literally exactly as Dr. Tracy was just saying. We're, we're knocking on the door. And it's not about what it's about, right? It's not about I'm knocking with a cupcake or I'm knocking with a complaint. <laughs> it's literally bidding for connection can be anything from like, oh, did you see the beautiful bird to, oh, I meant to tell you that I bumped into so-and-so mm -hmm. or how you doing or whatever the bidding is. And basically, I, I guess what they're saying is that X amount of times, seven out of 10 times, the masters of love get came back when their partner bid and gave them attention in some kind of a positive way. So it doesn't have to be super actively positive, but it's not negative and it's not rejecting. Um, yes. And I feel like when you have, like the client in my course, when you're so different, this is where there has to be the conversation of what's reasonable because the way that I saw it with this person in the course, it was like the um, anxiously attached partner was feeling that their feeling of needing this from the partner is correct. And then not doing it is rejecting and mean and terrible, right? Oh, so yes, of course, right? Like I am we, right. Yeah. And you're wrong. That that's yep. kind of where, and that's, that's the sandbox analogy I love using is that mm -hmm. we can't play in our sandbox mm -hmm. and then invite our partners and say, but you can only play in my way because it's right. about co-creation. And so, yes, you have this need and it's much bigger than mine and what I can offer you. And then here's my ability to offer you. Now, how can we do this in a way that's going to work for both of us? And yeah. we need to step out of the who's right and wrong. Yes. And I think we also, you know, sort of swinging this back to codependency a little bit. When we're talking about interdependency, I feel like it's really important that we're aware that each person has needs and desires and preferences and their own attachment stuff and their own relational styles and their own, as I would call it, your downloaded relationship blueprint. Like we all come from somewhere. And I think that a lot of times the less vocal one is the one that sort of their needs, they're like, are less important. Um, so how do you, how do you suggest with couples that they communicate or, or like, what is it when you're, I mean, obviously couples therapy is great, mm -hmm. but what do they do when they're not with you? I, I sometimes see the mistake of couples being told by whatever it is that the person who doesn't, so whether it's a therapist or an, a post in some way or something, right. that the person who doesn't communicate then needs to start communicating. 
Mm. And so sometimes then what can happen is that that person steps into a, oh, okay, I'm going to vent. And this happened with a couple I was working with recently. They had said, well, I was told that I don't share enough. So I'm trying to share. See this? See, Dr. Tracy, I'm trying to do this. I'm trying to share things. And it just became this outpouring of all of these things. And they didn't have the strategies or tools on how to do it effectively. And so here is a partner who was previously shut down now saying, I stepped into the relational space. Look, except the other partner is feeling attacked and criticized. And it's like, okay, well, now I can't do anything right. I wanted you to open up, but now we've got this tsunami coming in and I don't know what to do with that. So I, I want to structure it a bit more for people who struggle with that shutdown position, which is print out something around emotions so that you can help to identify what that internal experience actually is. The emotion wheels, one I give to people in my program. Um, I know some people have like different colors that they can talk about and each day identify one emotion so that you're you're, you're structuring the sharing, not as a venting and I'm releasing everything that you do that's bothering me now instead of bottling it up. But instead, I'm looking at the emotion wheel. I'm not going to do frustrated because we all stick in frustrated a little too mm. often. But I'm going mm. around the wheel and look, oh, you know what? I felt a little bit of uncertainty today. And then you can share what was what was happening? What thoughts did you have? What do you want me to know about that uncertain feeling? Mm-hmm. And then you each take turns, which allows you to practice naming an emotion, sharing, and then the other person can practice listening to that and asking mm-hmm. questions. It's also a great way to open communication because it's not directed at each other, but rather building shared experiences. That's such a great idea. And it's non-threatening. Like Part of why that works, I imagine, with couples is because you're proactively and preemptively being like, hey, you could make friends with your emotions so that when you're jacked, you like it's very difficult to do that if we're already activated. Yeah. You know. So where do you, you know, I just saw something that you had posted on Instagram about defensiveness and I see this a lot with my therapy clients feeling like they're, I mean, the ones who are coming to me are saying that their partners are defensive. Now I'm not, I don't know that they're not also defensive, Mm -hmm. but let's talk a little bit about how this impacts relationships. Defensiveness. It is. It's so fascinating. I'm seeing my little one slide into defensiveness and you can just hear it. I'm just, but I, (laughs) and, and it's a familiar space. And of course my husband knows I talk about this, but he is a master in defensiveness Mm. and defensiveness is really about protecting ourselves and our sense of worth. Because when information is coming towards us, that feels like it's crackling our base in some way. We've got to find some way to repair that so that we don't crumble. And so for many people, receiving feedback has never been a safe place for them. So they learn to build walls or they saw other people be defensive when they expressed needs. And so that defensiveness just seeps in, in the relationship, which really says, I need to protect myself before I can even enter into what it is that you're saying. Mm. And that creates the kind of hyper-independent space that we don't want to go into. Yeah. The, um, I love a quote from Dr. Harriet Lerner, who I love is like, uh, she's just my, she's just my psychological hero forever and ever. She says, um, defensiveness is the arch enemy of listening. Mm. Oh, it's so true. And for anyone who has not, please read The Dance of Anger. It oh, is such a good book. So good. And it's still, it. her work, why is she so amazing to me? Is her work just stands up. It's And it was so influential. Mm in my work. So don't worry in the show notes, you guys, besides putting Tracy's book in there, we'll put Mm -hmm. a link to Dr. Harriet Lerner's books as well. Because even just the concept of relationships being dances and that as we evolve and change our steps in a way, the other person can't really fully do the old dance. Mm -hmm. And that really spoke to me 
think I read that in the 80s, like a really long time ago, but from a relational point of view, long before I was a therapist, I really was like, oh my God, that's so true. This is exactly what it's like. What are your thoughts about a lot of my people in my crew, a lot of people listening to this are on their own sort of therapeutic journey, their evolutionary journey. They're looking in, they're more self-reflective, they're taking courses, they're meditating, they're journaling. Like they're, they're on this path of really trying to unearth self-knowledge, self-acceptance, all those things. Many of them are married to folks who are not doing this. So hmm. what do you tell me your thoughts on that? Oh. It is so hard when you have showed up to something and the other person hasn't. And one place we need to start is by asking ourselves, how do we understand that to mean about our own lovability if they are not the same as us? There's a sense mm -hmm. of security when we can say we are the same. And there's a sense of uncertainty if we are different. So if I'm doing all this work, will we still be together in a year? Right. Will I still want to be with you? Will you meet me in this space? And I, I know this is something that most people end up in my community in this sense is because they come to me saying, my partner doesn't want to do this work, but I'm ready. And so I remind people, do the work for you. Because at the end of the day, you say to yourself, you ask yourself rather, did I choose with what was aligned with me in this moment? Did I live a meaningful life today? And only you get to choose that. And developing that interdependence is about being able to say, you are not in this space of knowledge and acceptance and insight that I am. And I can still accept you in that place. There's something really beautiful about that and about interdependence. And I think that at least in my experience with my therapy clients and courses that people don't so much of the time, there's no modeled behavior for interdependence. And I think when I was, when we were talking on your show, I was saying that in, you know, in my marriage, like I didn't want to get married and, you know, I didn't think I was going to get married in my life. And what I wanted is what I got, but it took, I didn't get married until I was 35 and I had done a ton of work before that, which is with Vic, I feel securely tethered and completely free. And it's like, I look at interdependence as that. And I loved how you described it. We can be individuated from the other. I remember breaking up with a boyfriend early on, the only other person I ever lived with many years ago. I mean, decades ago. Um, but it was o over an incident where he was like, you don't understand. Like, I don't want you doing that, the thing, whatever the thing is that I was doing. I don't like that. I don't whatever. And I just had, I was like, you don't understand. We're not the same effing person. You cannot like it and I can still fucking do it. Like, you are not the boss of me. And that was the end for me. It was only one, only once ever did I have a codependent relationship. Like that was the really like sticky, yicky codependent mm. where pff, you're like not even living in your own life. Right. But I'm so grateful that I got out. So with folks who come to you in codependent relationships, what, what, let's talk about how, how you talk about it in the book and let's talk about how do we, how do we unhook from these behavioral patterns that are so ingrained. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is. Oh gosh. It, it's really about that sense of self-awareness in those moments. And if I were to break it down into what is something so powerful that we could do in those moments, it's depersonalization. Mm. And as you're telling that story of your ex, it is that, okay, you did that. It's not about me and creating that, that sense of separation and acknowledging I'm having a reaction to what you did. And I can see that you did this because it was important to you or whatever that is. Right. And mm -hmm. we can not have to agree on that, but when we personalize it, that's when we continue to stay fused and stuck. And so 
couples really need to start slowing things down and mm. getting curious about what is happening in the moment. It's not, it's not what we talk about. And I know you know this as well. We have heard some great fights in the years of our work, whether mm. we're fighting about boiling water, something the kids did, the in-laws, sex, it can, or the, the socks, right? Or the coffee mug was left right beside the sink. Mm. And it's not the, the what, it's the how we're doing this. Yeah. How are we getting stuck in this pattern? First, being able to step out of the pattern in whatever way we can, which is, oh, we're, we're stuck right now. Hang on. Something's not feeling good. Let's press pause. We're going to soothe our nervous systems in the way that we can. Mm -hmm. And then from there, being able to piece apart. And that takes good communication to do that. Mm -hmm. But to piece apart things, it is depersonalization. I think that is one of the most foundational pieces to step out of emotional fusion and codependency, yep. don't you think? It's so good. Yeah, I do. Now that, now that you said it just like that, like, I don't know if I would have thought of it exactly that way, but it's so true. It's like in the making it all personal, because if I think back to my younger therapy clients and myself, when I was in therapy in my early 20s, how I, rem I literally remember talking to my therapist about my college boyfriend and how I, I, I picked a place for us to go eat and he didn't like it. And I was mad because he's a jerk. And she was like, what, what, why are you the chef? Mm. And she's like, Terry, why, why do you take all those things so personally? And I was like, because I feel overly responsible for the world. I mean, I didn't have the, I didn't have the brain to think that then, but it was true, but it made me realize there was another way that I could do it. And that I didn't have to take it personally. And then why should he pretend he liked something that he didn't just because I picked the restaurant who gives a shit? Like mm -hmm. there was something really profound about being like, Wow, it's like in uh, The Way We Were. Remember The Way We Were with Barbara Streisand and Rev Redford? And one of the pivotal scenes, he's like, why do you take everything so personally? And she's like, because it is personal, you know? And, and it's so interesting to think of that type of movie scene, but it not translating into what happened in relationships at the time. Because then I think of how many people come to therapy who have parents who expect them to be the caretakers of their emotions mm. and our clients get swept away in guilt if they have a boundary with a parent which is what you and i talked about in our last time sitting together but yeah. right but it, that's not just with a parent it's then also with your partner i feel guilty of having this emotion i feel guilty for having this need mm. and being able to understand that we are not responsible for others' emotions yeah. reactions, which always comes with that. Hang on. That's not the full picture. Let's do self other context here of, mm -hmm. I can have this experience. I can see that experience. I can bring in empathy, respect, and, you know, connection and intention, all of that matters, but it really is that learning to step out of, I'm not, it's okay. If you have a hard reaction to something that's life. Yeah. Right. But it's being able to tolerate it. Mm. Yes. Sitting and in that, that sense that, of discomfort. If we could all do yeah. that a little bit yeah. more, our relationships could deepen just a little bit. It's so true. So in writing this book, I didn't sign up for this, which I love the name so much because I mean, how many times in your marriage just something happened and you think, I didn't sign up for this. Many times. <laughs> I didn't. <laughs> but the true stories that you share in the book, the case studies, basically, can you pick one out to share with us? Mm. Gosh, they're all my favorites. So interesting. I, I think of Ashley in the book. And Ashley, I think, is so many of us who is the perfectionist, high achieving woman who comes to therapy on her own. And it, there is that sense of my love and worthiness is based on whether my partner is happy and okay. And so as a result, then I don't share my feelings and needs and I am stuffing it down. But oh, because when we subjugate all day long, we need to find an outlet and she has an outlet and it's not helping their relationship. And writing her story felt so close to mine, just in the sense of identifying that sense of perfectionism and mm -hmm. striving and constantly doing. And acknowledging just how difficult it is to step back to see that we put these internal pressures on ourselves that do build resentment 
in our relationships and recognizing that part of tackling that resentment feeling that comes up that leads people to say, I didn't sign up for this (laughs) is in part recognizing how do I show up in the world? Mm. What do I do with all of my internal stuff? And is that actually working for me to build connection and closeness with others? It's so good. And, and the, for Ashley, so she had an outlet, but she was resentful. And it's like, the question is, when do we, because at least I know there's a blind spot that many of my high functioning codependent clients, especially perfectionists have, where it's about the other person. I have resentment because you're entitled. I have resentment because you have an expectation that I'll do all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And a lot of times therapeutically, when we unpack this with client, when I unpack this with clients, I'm like, but do they have that expectation or do you have that expectation? Yes. I'm so glad that you brought that in here because I know that as part of that high functioning codependency is how I show up here that I hold these high expectations. I will just do all the things. And the other person says, okay, well, if I don't feel good doing it, then I'm not going to keep trying. And instead of going inside of ourselves and saying, what do I what do I do to contribute to this? How can I be different? How can I actually find more sense of agency? And mm-hmm. the, this sparked a lot of conversation in my community around let your partner struggle a little bit more, let them fail, not in a malicious way, but in the sense that if your partner says, yes, I will start making lunches for the kids. And then you see your partner sitting on the couch at the end of the day, and you're thinking, mm-hmm. well, I want to sit in the couch, but they have to make lunch. So do you just go and make lunch? Well, if you do choose, choose, if you choose that, that's likely to build more resentment. But what if yep. you allowed yourself to also choose sitting on the couch? Yep. You could have that choice. You can have that sense of agency and power. Yep. It's so, it's so funny. It, that reminds me so much what you're saying of the, the meme that was going around where it was based at moms and, you know, busy women. So stop doing everything. And then the woman says, who the f- is going to do it? Yes. Right. Literally, if I don't do it, who the F is going to do it? And that was viral for so long and so many people. And if, I, I went into the comment section to see. And that is such a mantra for high functioning codependence, for sure, mm-hmm. that if I don't, no one will. And yet, I feel like in all these scenarios we're talking about, our job is to let the chips fall where they may when they're not our chips. If your partner says, I'm going to make lunch, lunch chips are now their chips. Yes. If it means they have to get up early because they forgot to do it, let that happen. And yet that can be so uncomfortable, especially if you're a perfectionist and you're always planning, right? We have the, we are, I call it anticipatory anxiety, right? Where we are anticipatory planning to avoid the chaos in the morning. We, we don't want there to be a problem. We're always thinking. But again, we can do that for ourselves. But when we're doing it in our relationships, other people really feel managed and do not like it is my experience. I have been processing this different, like the differentiation between anxiety and mental load. I've been <clears throat> mulling it over in my head and you're bringing it forward right here, which is the anticipatory anxiety. And that experience of wanting to avoid discomfort and just a personal story, I had been the diaper purchaser, planner, knowing when to go up the next size for the entire four years, four and a half years. And we were switching kind of roles in the home and I could see the diapers were dwindling down. Maybe there were (laughs) pull-ups at that point. And I thought, what would happen if... And it's not to say that my husband and I had ever said, I'm going to be the purchaser of diapers. Don't you ever worry about it. It just happened that that's where Mm -hmm. our chips were falling. But things were changing in our relationship. I thought, what would happen if? And could we bear that discomfort? Yes, the answer is we could. It was not the end of the world. We don't live hours from a store to buy some. And the best thing was my daughter at the time, two and a half, 
they run out of the last one. They don't have one ready. And her response is, oh, daddy, disappointed. And so the response, though, from her of flailing on the floor without having her diaper was enough of the reaction for my husband to see, oh, I need to pay attention to this. This is right. And of course, as a couples therapy, I will say, yes, okay. I took the passive approach and stepped back and didn't, you know, it's better when we say to our partners, hey, let's let's change up our chips here. Let's pass the rolls on this. Mm-hmm. I did not do that. I admit that. But it was definitely a good learning lesson for both of us. I love that. And hey, he didn't do that either. But part of what I think happens because of human nature is exactly what you're saying. We have an experience mm-hmm. that motivates change in our behavior. Yes. And when we're constantly preventing others in our lives from having those experiences that motivate them to make changes that they need to make, we're robbing them because of our short-term comfort. We're robbing them and thinking that we know what everyone should be doing. I feel like we just don't, you know? That quote goes into the, I don't tell my partner how I'm feeling. I don't want to upset them. And it's the, yes, let them know what's happening for you in a way to build connection. But when Mm -hmm. your partner comes home and they're in a grumpy mood or they're slamming cupboards, that's not okay. So you say to them, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm going to go out. I'm going to go have some solo time. I see you're struggling right now. I can't be around when you're slamming the cupboards. Mm -hmm. That is the impact that's the consequence of that behavior and so there's an opportunity for them to experience that that boundary of yours and then to think about next time they come home in that mood yeah the consideration right Mm -hmm. what what you're saying is that we are in speaking up you are saying i require a certain amount of consideration it's Mm. not like you can never be frustrated you can it's funny. I, I have like my my limit. I hit a tipping point with Bick because he can be he can be dark. He's you know European second you know first generation American. You know he's got his things right. Um, As we all do. And, yes, we do. Mm-hmm. We do. And and we have very different backgrounds. So mine are different than his, but I have them. But you know I will now after a million years of therapy, right? I can tolerate a certain amount of. If there's a moodiness, he doesn't like the the gray weather that we're experiencing. I'm always like, everything is cozy. Let's just turn on the fireplace. It's great. You know, he's like, yeah, I know you love it, but I don't love it. You know, but then if it leads into, depends on how many days, if it's one day, fine. and, And I also, we just naturally will try to pick up the slack, do something he likes, you know, just, just be kind. Like I know you're struggling and I'm here and I'm okay. So whoever is the least compromised, right? We always have that agreement. Like you can't both crack up at the same time. So whoever's the least compromised, you're going to step up for the relationship, not a problem. But you know, I'm also not having three days of just like a dark mood that's toxifying my space and not necessarily slamming anything, but I'll say, Hey, it sounds, seems like you're struggling. Can we talk? Right. That that's it. It's like an invitation. Well, well, what is there to talk about? I'm like, I don't know. But what I'm inviting you to do is not. It feels like you're taking it out on me because you're isolating and I want to connect about it. I'm here. And and he he shakes it off, you know, but there's got to be some some um, forward motion, as you were saying, to create consideration where, and it is a boundary. It's an emotional boundary. Like Uh this, this is my end, you know? All right. I want to ask you one more question. Can I personally, what has been your most challenging boundary struggle and how did you overcome it? If you have, Oh my goodness. Hmm. I was not prepared for this one. (laughs) I remember at one point identifying that I had porous boundaries And here I am a decade into my career or more thinking I'm solid with boundaries. I'm good. And then understanding my resentment towards loved ones, like friends. And it would be something like, okay, we're going to get together on Friday. And in my head, I'm thinking, let's do 10 a.m. because I need to get some work done in the afternoon. My friend says 2 p.m. Oh, I say yes. And I was a yes person for a very long time and silently grew resentful and created distance when I wasn't feeling good. 
And so my biggest boundary has been around asking for help and letting others know what I need. And you're not surprised by that from an HFC, no. right? But it, it is that sense of saying, actually, that doesn't work for me. And yep. wow, that's powerful and so hard. But how do you feel when you do it? Deeply uncomfortable at the beginning. But then when I am connected in a way that works for both of us, so much better afterwards. Yep. Yeah. Wow. So beautiful. I loved it. Um, you guys, the book is, I didn't sign up for this. A couple's therapist shares real life stories of breaking patterns and finding joy in relationships, including her own. You do not want to miss this book. You guys get it anywhere. Fine books are sold. Dr. Tracy, thank you so much. Where can people find you? Let's my, talk about that. Yes. My favorite spot is over on Instagram. That's where I hang out. And I believe we're there to be social. So send me a DM. Let me know what stood out from today's conversation. And Terry, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you.